we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving us another opportunity to to meet and hold inshallah another productive session as we reflect on Surah At-Tawbah. As I mentioned in the earlier sessions, Surah At-Tawbah is one of the most controversial surahs in the Holy Quran because it's a surah that speaks at length about the about military engagement with the idolaters and oftentimes enemies of Islam cite verses to prove that Islam is a religion of violence that Islam is a religion that calls for war Islam is a is a religion that seeks to exterminate the disbelievers but when you look at this surah carefully you find that there are certain verses that never seem to get any media coverage usually there will be a focus on the verses that say kill the disbelievers wherever you find them but you will you rarely hear anyone shedding light on for example ayah number six that we discussed in our last session where in the middle of war Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the believers that if an idolater if a mushrik seeks asylum and wishes to listen to the Quran you should grant them that opportunity that even in the middle of war the process of guidance should never be abandoned and you find that in the middle of war if a disbeliever wishes to listen to the holy quran and wishes to enter islamic territory muslim territory they are to be granted protection and when they listen to the holy quran they're given the freedom to either accept or reject if they accept they're considered your brethren if they reject the muslims are responsible for they're responsible for escorting that disbeliever to a safe location and to continue the war effort if that's what they seek and you find that they are also called to come to medina and listen to the holy quran from the prophet which means that the quality of the islamic education that they are to receive is the best quality that they are to be taught islam by the most qualified person in the muslim community and at that time it would be the prophet so even though the context of these verses is war allah subhanahu wa ta'ala still wants the mu'mineen to bear in mind that the purpose of this conflict is to create an, an, an environment where people can get closer to god where people can achieve this inner tranquility so the the effort to guide exists even in times of war now if we go to ayah number seven allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says كَيْفَ يَكُونُ لِلْمُشْرِكِينَ عَهْدٌ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ وَعِنْدَ رَسُولِهِ إِلَّا الَّذِينَ عَاهَدْتُمْ عِنْدَ الْمَسْجِدِ الْحَرَامِ فَمَا اسْتَقَامُوا لَكُمْ فَاسْتَقِيمُوا لَهُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ الْمُتَّقِينَ How can the idolaters have a treaty with God and with his messenger except for those with whom you made a treaty at the sacred mosque? If they remain true to you, remain true to them. Truly God loves the reverent. Now, Surah at tawbah as I mentioned in our first session, it was revealed in the ninth year after the Hijrah. The Holy Prophet ﷺ, when he conquered Mecca in the eighth year after the Hijrah, the year before the revelation of this surah there were many different tribes that came to the prophet and there were there were different tribes that approached the prophet some tribes 
came to the Holy Prophet when he was in Mecca and they told the Prophet that they were not interested in becoming Muslims but also they were not interested in fighting the Prophet and the Muslim community so they were not interested in converting to Islam but they were not hostile they were not interested in fighting the Holy Prophet so they they sought a covenant with the Holy Prophet they made a treaty that there will be no fighting amongst them and this was a valid covenant this was a covenant established after the Prophet conquered Mecca and it was enacted in close proximity to Masjid al-Haram now there were other tribes who approached the Prophet after he conquered Mecca because you have to keep in mind that for the first time in the history of Islam the Muslims are now the dominant force so now they're really in a position to to punish so you have all of these tribes approaching the Prophet seeking protection seeking to gain some type of treaty some type of peace agreement so the first group were the, the tribes that approached the Prophet they were not interested in becoming Muslims and they were not interested in fighting the Muslims either so they enact an agreement with the Prophet so this was the first group the second group they also approached the Prophet after the conquest of Mecca they also had a covenant with the Prophet but they broke their treaty they broke they violated the terms of their agreement with the Prophet and they are the ones whom the Prophet repudiates so Bara'a was directed to them and then you have the third now these are tribes that did not they did not establish any official covenant with the Prophet there was just a mutual understanding that we're not gonna fight you and you're not gonna fight them but it was not an official covenant it was just this mutual understanding this nonverbal mutual practice that we're not gonna interfere with you and you're not gonna inter interfere in our affairs now when some of the tribes broke the covenant with the Prophet and the Holy Prophet sends Amir al Mu'mineen to Mecca, as we discussed, to announce that these idolaters don't have immunity anymore and it's now all out war. The third group, who did not have an official agreement with the Prophet, who did not have an official treaty or covenant, they, they tell the Prophet that, Ya Rasulullah, O Muhammad, we have a covenant with you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers them in this verse. How could the God and his messenger have a covenant with you? There was no such covenant. The only covenant that exists were the covenants that were established at Masjid al-Haram, the official treaties that were signed. Allah tells the Prophet that those who remained true, so this is a reiteration of what was mentioned in the previous verses, that those who violated their treaties with you, you wait four months and it's war. But those who honored their agreement with you, those who remained true to their treaties, remain true to your treaty with them do not violate your agreement uphold that pledge that you made to them so even though the Prophet ﷺ is in a position of power Allah reminds the Prophet that you still have to honor the promises that you made to these minorities they may be weak you might be able to punish them and destroy them and no one can stop you but as someone who is God-fearing, as someone who is a faithful person, you should honor this pledge. 
إن الله يحب المتقين. Now there's there's a lot of discussion among the Mufassirin regarding the meaning of the last part of this verse. Allah says, إن الله يحب المتقين. Allah loves the muttaqin, those who have taqwa. Now who is this referring to? Is it referring to the, the believers or is it referring to the mushrikeen who honored, who remained true to their pledge? Now you may find it puzzling. Why is it that some mufassireen believe that the muttaqin in this verse could refer to the mushrikeen? You may say, how could it be that a mushrik is described as a muttaqi? You see, brothers and sisters, there are a number of views among the mufassireen. Some of them say, Inna Allah yuhibbul muttaqin, surely God loves the muttaqin, refers to the believers who honor the pledges that were made by the mushrikeen who have not violated their agreements. These are people of taqwa. Other mufassireen say, no, the muttaqeen here is in reference to the mushrikeen who honored their pledge to the Prophet. And some say it refers to both. The important thing is that this is referring, Allah loves those who honor their pledges, who are true to their words. Now, in the Holy Quran, the word taqwa sometimes is used in a general sense and sometimes it's used in a very specific sense. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Holy Quran, there is precedence in the Quran for using the word muttaqeen to describe non-Muslims. It's interesting that if you look at Surah Ali Imran, Surah number 3, verses 75 and 76, Allah describes some honest, trustworthy people among Ahlul Kitab, among the people of the book, as being people of taqwa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, وَمِنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ مَنْ إِنْ تَأْمَنْهُ بِقِنْطَارٍ يُؤَدِّهِ إِلَيْكِ Allah says that there are some among the people of the book. There are some Jews, there are some Christians who are so trustworthy that if you entrust them with a heap of gold, with a huge amount of wealth, you they will return the trust to you just as you gave it to them. And from among the people of the book, مَنْ إِنْ تَأْمَنْهُ بِدِينَارٍ لَا يُؤَدِّهِ إِلَيْكَ إِلَّا مَا دُمْتَ عَلَيْهِ قَائِمًا And there are also some from among the Jews and the Christians whom if you entrust them with one gold coin, one dinar, they will not return that trust to you unless you demand it from them, unless you're on top of them. Why is that? Allah says, ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّهُمْ قَالُوا لَيْسَ عَلَيْنَا فِي الْأُمِّيِّينَ سَبِيلٍ this ayah is referring to some of the Bani Israel, some of the Jews who felt that they had no moral responsibility when it came to honoring contracts with Gentiles. If I'm dealing with a Jew, then I have to respect and honor this pledge. But there is a separate standard that is, that is given to the Gentile, and that is that their wealth has no value, that we don't honor their wealth. So this is ayah number 75. In the next ayah, Allah continues. He says, Bala man awfa bi'ahdi. Those who are who fulfill their oaths, like those members of Ahlul Kitab in the previous verse, wa and who have taqwa. فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ الْمُتَّقِينَ Allah describes those members of Ahlul Kitab who are trustworthy as being muttaqeen. Now you may tell me, how can they be muttaqeen if they're not 
Muslims. It's because here taqwa refers to the conscience. They are careful when it comes to listening to their conscience. And Allah loves those who listen to their conscience, who listen to that inner voice, who listen to an nafsul lawama, that, that accusing soul, that inner voice that calls out to you when you're about to commit an immoral act. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, going back to ayah number seven of Surah at tawbah when Allah says, Inna Allah yuhibbul muttaqeen, Allah loves those who have taqwa, who are careful, who are cautious when it comes to observing the boundaries of morality, who listen to their conscience. Some Mufassirin say this is about the Mushrikeen. Because everyone who wants to be guided, the only way that someone can be guided to Islam is that they have to listen to their conscience. If you go to Surah Al-Baqarah, the second ayah of Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah says, Alif Lam Mim, ذلك الكتاب لا ريب فيه هدى للمتقين. That this book, this Quran is guidance for who? For muttaqin, for people of taqwa, for people who listen to their conscience. This is this book will benefit them. So there is a taqwa that precedes faith and then there is a taqwa that comes after faith so you have an individual who may not be muslim but they have a conscience and that conscience will perhaps one day lead them to iman and once they become mu'min that conscience will be strengthened so you see that from a quranic perspective the word taqwa has a very broad meaning. Sometimes it's used in the general sense to refer to being careful to listen to this inner voice, this conscience. And then in some cases it refers to this cautious attitude when it comes to observing the laws of the sharia. Ah. So we have moral limits that are set by the sharia. Ah. This is the specific meaning of taqwa. This is the taqwa after faith. And then you have the taqwa that precedes faith, which is being careful not to cross the boundaries, the moral boundaries that are set by your own soul, that are set by your conscience. So this is why Allah says, Inna Allah yuhibbul muttaqeen. And my dear brothers and sisters, If you want to gain nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, one of the mufassireen of the Quran, he says that if someone is truly interested in attaining nearness to Allah, to become, to achieve this state of qurba, this proximity to God, go through the Quran and find all of the verses where Allah says, Inna Allah yuhibbu. Surely Allah loves muttaqeen. So be a person who listens to your conscience. Inna Allah yuhibbul tawabin. Allah loves the ones who repent. So be a person who repents. Inna Allah yuhibbul muhsinin. Allah loves those who do good deeds. Take advantage and always seize any opportunity to do good. Become someone who is loved by God by acquiring all of the qualities that are beloved to God. Because when Allah loves someone, He brings them close to Him. So go through the Quran and find all of those verses where Allah mentions the qualities that He loves. Because in order to gain nearness to Allah, when Allah loves someone, He brings them close. In the same way that when you love someone as a human being, when you love someone, you want them to be close to you. You want to be in their company. You want to be in their presence. So as individuals who want to gain proximity to Allah, we have to first identify what are the qualities, what are the character traits that are beloved to Allah. And then we have to make an effort to adopt 
those qualities. Inna Allah yuhibbul muttaqeen. In ayah number eight, Allah says, "Kaifa wa in yazharu alaykum la yarqubu fikum illa wa la dhimmatan yurdunakum bi afwahihim wa ta'ba qulubuhum wa aktharuhum fasiqun." Allah says, how? Since if they prevail over you, they will not observe any kinship or treaty with you. They please you with their mouths while their hearts refuse. And most of them are transgressors. The next five to six verses in this surah in the next five or six verses, you see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to motivate the believers to prepare for war. Now it seems, now it's not explicitly said in these verses, but it seems we can deduce from these verses that there were many Muslims, many of the Sahaba, were reluctant to fight. They were reluctant to go to war. So again, these ayat give us a glimpse into the final, the final two years of the Prophet's life. What was happening in Medina at the end of the Prophet's life? Because unfortunately, many Muslims today try to paint this picture that all of the companions of the Prophet were pious and they were obedient to the Prophet and they seized any opportunity to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But here from ayah number eight, we get the sense that many of the companions of the Prophet were reluctant to respond to the call of the Prophet to go to war with the Mushrikeen. Now, why is that? Why were many of the companions are reluctant to go to battle, to go to the battlefield. It's because if you look at the history of Islam, if you look at this religious movement known as Islam, you'll find that for many years, the Muslims were struggling. They were struggling to survive. They were a religious minority in Mecca. They were persecuted. They had to migrate from Mecca to Medina. They fought war after war after war, and many of them were sick of war. They were tired of fighting. And especially after the battle of Khaybar, where Muslims suddenly became, the Muslim community was exposed to a great deal of material affluence. Many Muslims were very comfortable Financially, they were very comfortable. They were well off. They were, their lives were finally stable in Medina. They were enjoying the comforts of life. So now that it's the ninth year after the Hijrah, and that they're being called to go fight, many of them were reluctant. They wanted to relax now. They were not interested in fighting. Because brothers and sisters, when you have nothing, you go to the battlefield because you have nothing to lose. But when you have a home and you have money and you have a business and you have children, it's a, it's a lot more difficult to sacrifice because you have a lot to lose now. You've become attached to the comforts and the luxuries of this life. So there is reluctance in the ranks of the Muslims to go and fight. So this is one reason. So one of the reasons why there is this reluctance is because many Muslims were comfortable in Medina. They were not interested in war. Furthermore, many of the Muslims, many of the companions of the Prophet, they had relatives who, were, who belonged to those tribes who violated their treaties with the Prophet. So when they are called to go to the battlefield, they're essentially being asked to go fight against their non-Muslim relatives. 
their extended family members, sometimes maybe even their direct family. So there's this reluctance to go and fight. And this is very telling, my dear brothers and sisters. You know, it really makes you wonder how we will react when the 12th Imam reappears. Are we going to be reluctant to respond to his call? Are we going to be too attached to the comforts of our lives? You know, when the 12th Imam reappears, and it could be that there will be a military conflict and you're called to go and fight. You might think to yourself that, oh, I went to school for five, six years. I got my degree. I just purchased a home. I just got a promotion. I just had, you know, I just started a family. These are, these are the same excuses that the Muslims were giving the prophets. They were reluctant to sacrifice because without even realizing it, they started to become attached. They forgot the ultimate purpose of life. They have, they have relatives on the other side of the battlefield. And this is why, my dear brothers and sisters, Imam al-Husayn, alayhi salatu was salam, he says, Anasu abidu dunya that people are slaves of this earthly life, of this material world. Anasu abidu dunya people are slaves of dunya. And religion is something that they just talk about. It's something that's on their tongues. Religion is just talk. The moment they are tried, the moment they are asked to sacrifice, when they're taken out of their comfort zone and they have to make some real sacrifices, the Imam says, this is when you will realize that the people of Deen, the real religious people are very few. People will be religious as long as their interests are protected, as long as they are not inconvenienced. I love Islam as long as I can go to the masjid, I listen to a lecture, I come home and I'm comfortable, I don't experience any hardship. I'm perfectly happy with this version of Islam. But, but the moment there's struggle, there's, there's adversity, there's pain, there's suffering, that's when I relinquish my faith. This is the attitude of many. This is not something that's new. This was the mindset even during the time of the Prophet. Now, what's also interesting, another thing that I'd like to mention is that, you know, when you read about, when you, when you read books on the history of Islam, especially by Orientalists, you find that there are many, especially non-Muslim historians, who portray the Prophet as a very clever politician who was able to take people, the Arabs, who had a thirst for warfare, who were, who were naturally violent people. And he was able to unite them and divert their violence and their aggression to external enemies. There's this idea in the minds of many Orientalists that the Arabs had a perpetual thirst for war. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, the Holy Prophet, capitalized on this violent inclination among the Arabs to unite them and divert and focus their, their, their violence and their brutality against others in order to expand their empire. But you find when you look at the Qur'an, and you look at and you study history objectively you'll find that yes there was there were there was tribal warfare among the arabs in the same way that there's a war in every among all people in all civilizations there is war but you find that the arabs were not always thirsty for war this is a misconception in fact the meccans the mushrikeen in Mecca especially 
it was in their economic interest to always avoid war because Mecca was a religious tourist destination and war is bad for tourism so you find the Meccans even the Mushrikeen among them they wanted peace because peace was good for business you know they didn't want peace for noble reasons but they wanted it for economic reasons also the fact that the people of Yathrib the people of Medina provided a safe haven to the Prophet when he went on his hijrah indicates that the people of Yathrib also wanted peace there was conflict between an Aus and Khazraj and they invited the Prophet because they felt that the Prophet could establish peace among these quarreling tri tribes so this idea this notion that Arabs are just naturally violent and they have this constant thirst for war and military conflict is not true because even in this ayah you find that the Prophet faced difficulty in motivating many of the Muslims to fight if the Arabs were naturally violent and they loved war and war was just like a sport for them then it wouldn't make sense that the Prophet is putting so much effort to motivate them to go to war to fight Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also tells the believers that you don't many of the Muslims did not want to go to war because they say oh there, there was we have kinship we have extended family with these tribes that you're asking us to fight we have an agreement you know many of these tribes there would be intermarriages you know a man would marry a woman from a tribe for political reasons because when you marry from a tribe that tribe becomes your ally so they have treaties from the time of jahiliya they have relatives so you see the muslims some of the muslims are unwilling to fight but allah tells them that if these mushrikeen who you are reluctant to fight if they had power over you they would fight you they wouldn't give any attention they would not observe any kinship or any treaty with you now these mushrikeen are saying that we're family we shouldn't fight we have dhimma we have a treaty with you from jahiliya allah says now they're speaking very pleasantly with you because they are weaker they are inferior to you now militarily they are inferior they speak sweet words with their mouths here allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to teach the mu'mineen not to be naive the problem with a lot of muslims today is that they're very naive they believe the sweet talk of the enemies of islam have you seen you know every, every ramadan you know, you, you see a prime minister or president come out and he wishes all of the Muslims a happy Ramadan. You have a president, prime minister, they deliver Eid greetings to the Muslims. And you see all the Muslims rejoice. Oh my God, did you see this president, this prime minister, you know, wish us a happy Ramadan? At the same time, he gives executive orders to drop bombs. On Muslim countries Muslims are naive Allah says that they please you with their mouths don't focus on what they say pay attention to what they do don't be manipulated Allah says their heart there's no authenticity between what they're saying to you and what is in their hearts Allah is telling the the believers that you're reluctant to fight the mushrikeen because you say oh there are relatives and we have a treaty with them if the tables were turned they would not care for you they would not care that you are 
relatives. If they have the upper hand, they would take advantage. They are sweet talking you now because they're weak. But if they were in a position of power, they wouldn't sweet talk you. So don't be naive. Be smart. Be wise. Be intelligent. وَأَكْثَرُهُمْ فَاسِقُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, most of them, most of these mushrikeen, they are fasiqoon. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the, the next ayah, He says, اشتروا بآيات الله ثمنا قليلا فصدوا عن سبيله إنهم ساء ما كانوا يعملون Allah says they had sold the signs of God for a paltry price and have turned from his way. Evil indeed is that which they used to do. Now this expression, اشتروا بآيات الله ثمنا قليلا that they have sold the signs of God for a minimal price, for a small price. This expression is commonly used throughout the Holy Quran. In most cases, this expression is used in reference to Ahlul Kitab, to the people of the book, the Jews and the Christians who distorted and adulterated the scriptures that were revealed to them, whether it's the Torah or the Injil. They would distort the verses for certain worldly gains. So they would sell the true meaning of God's words for a very small benefit, for a small worldly gain. They would give up a huge benefit, which is to gain nearness to Allah, which is to live a life of prosperity, which is to acquire tranquility, to gain the akhirah. All of these things, they give it up just for some small dunya we benefit. Now, in this ayah, Allah is not addressing Ahlul Kitab. This is probably the only or one of the only verses where the expression is being directed towards mushrikeen. That they sell the ayat of Allah for a small gain. Now, the Jews, they have the Torah. They have ayat of the Torah that they distorted for worldly gains. The Christians... They have the Injil that they distorted for the ayat of the Injil for worldly gains. The Mushrikeen don't have a book. So what verses have they sold for worldly gain? The answer may be, according to some of the Mufassireen, is that the Mushrikeen They, the ayat of the Qur'an were recited to them. So they turned away from the Qur'an, from the ayat of the Qur'an, and they refused to submit for the sake of a small worldly gain because they had a certain position in their tribe or in, in the pagan community. Or they had some certain worldly interests that they were trying to preserve by turning away from these ayat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells them that they sold themselves short. They wanted to gain a small worldly benefit, but at the expense of losing something great, losing a relationship with Allah, something that is lasting, something that will endure. Now, in this ayah, Allah says that the mushrikeen, not only do they sell the, the ayat of Allah, the verses of God, for a paltry price, they also, فَصَدُّوا عَنْ سَبِيلِهِ They 
bar people from his way. Now, if you look at the, the pagan community, you can categorize the pagans, the idolaters, the mushrikeen, into three, three main categories. The first category, they are the chieftains, the leaders of the tribes. This is number one. So these are the chiefs of the tribes, the leaders of the tribes. The second group, they are the, the clergymen among the mushrikeen. So these are the magicians, the kahins, and these are you know individuals who presumably had some supernatural abilities. They were perhaps magicians, they were able to summon jinn. They have some supernatural abilities, and this also indicates that having supernatural ability is not a sign that someone is close to God. You know, sometimes you hear of people that go, you know, they go to the Hausa, they go study at a seminary, and they meet with some self-proclaimed spiritual guru who's able to reveal things to them, who might have certain knowledge of the unseen, who might have certain abilities that captures their attention, but this is not an indication that someone is close to God. Because if having supernatural ability is a sign of divine proximity, then shaitan should be the closest to Allah. Shaitan is, he whispers into all of our hearts, he's invisible, he has all of these abilities. So in any case, this is the second category of mushrikeen. So you have the chiefs of the tribes, the leaders of the tribes, and then you have the clergymen who protect the ideology of shirk, who preserve the, the ideology of polytheism. And number three, you have the ordinary people, the laymen. Now, who is being addressed in this verse? Who are the ones who are selling God's signs for a minimal price and who are preventing people from the way of God? It's the first group and the second. The people who are in power, the leaders of the tribe, the clergymen among the polytheists, they are the ones who bar people from the way of God. Saddu an sabile. And this is one of the greatest crimes. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is mentioning reasons why the believers should fight the mushrikeen. Number one, these are individuals that are hostile. If they had the upper hand, they would destroy you. They are not people of integrity. They are people who are thirsty for your blood and if they have the opportunity they will they will capitalize and they will destroy you so don't be lenient towards them don't say though that there are relatives you know we have a treaty with them secondly these are individuals who are depriving people from reaching god you know brothers and sisters Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here wants the mu'mineen to fight against especially those first two groups because those people who are preventing people from reaching God are essentially depriving people of inner peace. You know, the human body is designed in a way that it can only be comfortable when the temperature is just right. If it's too hot, you're uncomfortable. If it's too cold, you're also uncomfortable. The temperature has to be just right for you to be comfortable. Similarly, the human soul, the only environment that the human soul feels comfortable in is when it's in the presence of God. When, when it's in close proximity to Allah. 
This is why Allah said, Allah bi dhikr la tatma'innul qulub. Surely with the remembrance of God, the hearts are at ease. You finally reach that equilibrium. That inner peace is achieved. Allah is saying, fight these people because they're depriving humanity of the opportunity to taste true happiness. So this gives you an entire perspective on the philosophy of jihad. That you're fighting for the sake of giving people a real shot at happiness, at joy, living a life of dignity. Because these leaders of these mushrikeen, of the tribes and the magicians and the sorcerers and the kinds, the clergymen, what makes them so wicked is that not only are they misguided, but they're not allowing anyone else to see the light. They are barring people from the way of God. an sabile, it gives this, it implies that we're all on a journey. It's not a spatial journey. It's not an external journey, but it's an inward journey. And these individuals are preventing people from going on this journey towards God. They are creating an environment where people are never going to experience the joy of being alive. Everyone exists, but Islam doesn't just want you to exist. Islam wants you to be alive, to truly be alive. Allah says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhalladheena aminu stajeebu lillahi wa lirrasool Iza da'akum lima yuhiikum O you who believe, answer Respond to the invitation of God and His Messenger when they invite you towards that which gives you life. Don't just exist. Be alive. And Allah here is trying to motivate the believers to fight for this reason, for this noble purpose, to eliminate the people who are depriving the rest of society from going on this journey towards God and this journey brothers and sisters this opportunity to grow as a human being and to achieve nearness to Allah this is such a beautiful and enjoyable journey that Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salatu wassalam he says ma yasurruni law mittu tiflan وَأُدْخِلْتُ الْجَنَّةِ وَلَمْ أَكْبُرُ فَأَعْرِفَ رَبِّي عز وجل. Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen, he says, I would not be happy if I died as a child and was made to enter Jannah. Because if a child dies, they're not mukallaf, Allah gives them paradise. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, he says, I would not be happy to die as a child and be given Jannah and be deprived of growing up and getting to know my Lord. Imam speaks about being deprived of growing up and going on this journey and getting closer and closer to Allah in this life. It's truly a crime to rob people, to bar them of the opportunity to go on this journey towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in ayah number 10, he says again, going back to why the believers should be adamant and should be steadfast in fighting the mushrikeen. Allah says, لا يرقبون في مؤمن إلا ولا ذمة وأولئك هم المعتدون. They they will not honor any believer, any believer's kinship or treaty, meaning the problem that the mushrikeen have with you is the fact that you believe. This is the reason why they have so much animosity towards you. It's because you're Muslims. And these mushrikeen, they are the transgressors. Now this concept of i'tida. It has two meanings, and I've, I've already alluded to this when I spoke about taqwa. When Allah says that the believers 
transgress, when the disbelievers transgress, sometimes i'tida in the Quran is used, it has two main meanings. Sometimes it's used to refer to crossing the limits of the Sharia. Ah. So when Allah is addressing mu'mineen and he mentions mu'tadun or i'tida, it means that you've crossed the moral boundaries set by the Sharia. Ah. But when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing non-Muslims and he's saying that what they're doing is crossing the limits, it means it is crossing the limits, the moral limits that were set by their conscience. Just because someone is not Muslim, it doesn't mean that they don't have an internal moral compass, that you're transgressing the moral boundaries dictated by your own conscience. And it's your conscience that dictates that if there are, if you have relatives, you should you should respect them, you should honor them. But the mushrikeen are not going to do that with you. Your conscience tells you that you should honor your pledge, you should honor your promise. You don't need religion to teach you that. Your conscience tells you that. But these mushrikeen have transgressed these moral boundaries set by the human conscience. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَإِن تَابُوا So whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala motivates the believers to fight, He supplements it with an exception. You know, in Islam, things are not just black and white. You see, there are always exceptions to rules. The Quran is very nuanced in its approach, especially to military conflict. That there are exceptions. فَإِن تَابُوا So this is war. You're fighting against mushrikeen. If anyone among the mushrikeen repents, so imagine there is a mushrik who is fighting in war against the Muslims, and perhaps he's killed some Muslims, and he decides he wants to become Muslim. He wants to convert. فَإِن تَابُوا So here, but if they repent, meaning that if they become Muslim and perform the prayer, فَإِن تَابُوا وَأَقَامُوا الصَّلَاةِ وَآتَوُوا الزَّكَاةِ فَإِخْوَانُكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ وَنُفَصِّلُ الْآيَاتِ لِقَوْمٍ يَعْلَمُونَ But if they repent and perform the prayer and give the alms, then they are your brethren in religion. And we expound the signs for a people who know. So imagine this. Imagine there's a mushrik who's killed many Muslims. And now he wants to join Islam. Allah says, if they repent and their faith is manifested, not just by words, by there, there, are, there are indicators that their conversion to Islam was real, that it wasn't just lip service. They're establishing prayer. They're paying zakat. You shouldn't hold a grudge against them. Imagine, even if this mushrik killed members of your family, relatives, when they become Muslim, you should not have any more resentment against them. You know, you and I sometimes we have a grudge against someone who doesn't say salam to us. Allah says, if a mushrik who was fighting you in the battlefield, who might have killed some members of your family, some relatives. If he becomes Muslim, you have to consider them your brother. There's no resentment. There's no grudges because Islam has done away with the crimes that they've committed. Allah ends by saying, and we expound the signs for a people who know. Allah has given us many reasons why the believers should be motivated to fight. So Allah says we expound on the signs. We give you multiple reasons why you should be motivated to fight and to sacrifice. Because you're fighting for a noble purpose. You're not just fighting for war booty. You're not just fighting to expand territory. You're fighting to create a society of God-conscious people.
a society where people listen to their conscience, a society that facilitates spiritual growth, that allows people to go on their journey towards their Lord. You know, when you look at the uh, the last verse that I mentioned, where Allah says, فَإِن تَابُوا وَأَقَامُوا الصَّلَاةُ وَآتَوُوا الزَّكَاةُ فَأَخْوَانُكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ you know, the concept of faith in Islam is different from the concept of faith in Christianity, for example. In Christianity, the concept of faith is related primarily to the heart. That faith is in the heart. As long as you have faith in the heart, actions are really something that's, that's secondary. That it's not your actions that will allow you to gain salvation, but it's rather the faith that's in the heart. And faith in the heart is sufficient. But you find in the Quran, in this ayah, faith is described as something that is beyond the heart. It's not just something that's in the heart. Because when the mushrik repents and becomes Muslim, that's not enough that this faith has to manifest through action. This is why we have a hadith from the Prophet ﷺ where he says, that faith is to have inner knowledge, inner knowledge in the heart. So part of faith in Christianity, faith is exclusively related to the heart. In Islam, Faith is partially related to the heart. Al-Iman ma'rifatun bil qalb. Iman is to have ma'rifah in the heart, to have this deep knowledge in the heart. Wa qawlun bil lisan. Faith is also speech. It's manifested through your words. Wa amalun bil arkan, and it's also manifested through actions on your limbs. So the Prophet describes faith as something that resides in the heart, it's expressed on the tongue, and it's also manifested on your limbs through actions. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us and guide us and illuminate our hearts with the teachings of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Wa akhru da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallallahu ala muhammadin wa alihi al-tahireen.